Hello, everyone. My name is Brad Miller. I am the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement and Philanthropy at the James Madison University, and I'm so glad you all joined us today. Uh, today, we're, this event will be led by Vanita Halliburton, co-founder and executive chairman of the Grant Halliburton Foundation, a nonprofit established in 2006 following the suicide death of her son, Grant Halliburton. Vanita is a frequent speaker on youth mental health and suicide prevention in schools, at, at professional conferences and throughout the community. She speaks from the heart about her son's battle with depression and bipolar disorder, his suicide at the age of 19, and the need for a collaborative and comprehensive approach to suicide prevention in our community. I'm really glad that she's able to join us today. Uh, and I think um, we'll all really benefit from, from what she has to tell us. Um, before we jump into this, the presentation, I'd like to just make one quick announcement about homecoming at James Madison. If any of you are aware of homecoming, of course, it's going to be a very different experience this year. And I threw some stuff up there, some links to follow uh, to really get a better understand, understanding of what homecoming will look like this year. Uh, so I hope you can join us. It'll be November 2nd and 8th. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Venita, who will take it from here. Well, good morning. I'm so happy to be with you all. And we're going to take a moment to do this share a screen thing. And um, sorry. I don't think we're seeing the right screen, are we? Let me try this again. Sometimes it takes two tries to get it right, but we get there eventually. And now, are you seeing the safe title slide? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So again, good afternoon. I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to uh, be with you all today and talk about a topic we all want to know more about, and that is keeping the young people in our lives safe. You know, over the past few months, we've experienced dramatic changes that have left many of us, adults and children alike, feeling isolated, disconnected, and anxious about the future. Now we're experiencing even more challenges as students, teachers, and parents navigate the process of re-entry into school and college life. The next steps our children take in life and in learning will depend on our ability to confront and calm those anxieties and fears. Keeping them safe is our job. Only now, there's so much more to the job description. So we're going to talk today about the issues affecting young people. But first, I want to tell you a little about my story. Before Grant Halliburton was a foundation, Grant Halliburton was a boy. Grant was a bolt of energy. He kept everyone laughing with his antics and wit. He astonished us all with his art and music. He was 14 when he was diagnosed with depression. And for the next five years, our family fought hard to help him overcome his depression and ultimately bipolar disorder. Grant fought hard too. He loved life and wanted to be whole and well. But in November of 2005, we lost the fight. Grant took his life at the age of 19. I tell this story every time I speak, not because it is a unique story, but because it is becoming all too common. The foundation that bears his name is working to help people recognize the signs of mental illness, know what to do before a treatable illness turns into a crisis, and know where to find help. So, you know, when our children are small, keeping our kids safe means one thing. It's about cabinet locks and outlet plugs and not touching a hot stove and learning how to cross the street. And when they're teens, it's a whole new ball game. It's about letting them go out into the world without your presence and protection. It's about knowing who to trust, using good judgment, making wise choices. It's about the internet and relationships and romantic relationships. So keeping our kids safe means looking out for their physical health and their mental and emotional health. And that's where we want to start. So today we're gonna to talk about three things, stress, depression, and suicide. And you'll see as we go along how these things are closely related. The first question might be what causes stress? 
With the COVID-19 pandemic, it often feels like our world has literally been turned upside down. It's stressful in so many ways, on top of the usual things in life that cause us stress. Some days, it feels great to have all this time together until sparks fly and then it feels like the kids are driving you up the wall. Sometimes everyone's feeling okay with the change of pace and the quiet, and then the next moment, they're feeling the utter boredom, missing friends and missing family. Our world has been turned upside down all right, and it is stressful. So here are a few things that stress us out as adults. All these things are really stressful to deal with. Death of a loved one, family problems, separation, divorce, an unsafe home life, abuse and neglect, financial problems, chronic illness or injury, a traumatic event such as natural disaster, theft or pandemic. Having a heavy workload or too much responsibility, loss of a job, taking care of an elderly or sick family member, trouble with the law. These are just some of the most basic things that, that befall many families, many adults. But um, today there's so many other stresses that are brought about by the pandemic um, that we would never have dreamed of, of counting among things that stress us out. New things we have to deal with every day. But what we sometimes forget is that children and youth feel all these same stressors and more. They're attuned to everything that's going on in the family. Adults sometimes don't think that. But this list on the, on the left, those are the exact same things we talked about that stress adults. Um, youth feel the stress of those as well. But on top of that, they have their own set of stressors, the demands of school, having too much on their plate, even good things like moving or changing schools or graduating. Those are stressful because they are things like many on these things on this list that they're experiencing for the very first time in life. And that's stressful. Friends and peer relationships, we know those bring a lot of stress. Being a victim of bullying, uh, teen dating violence and social media. For all the good that social media brings into our lives, it brings a lot of drama into our kids' lives as well. If I had to pick three things on this list that I think are stressing our children the most these days, I would say having too much on their plate, being a victim of bullying, and social media. So how do you deal with stress? Well, I think of stress sometimes as like a pressure cooker. It builds up and it builds up and it demands a release. We feel like everything else is controlling us and we have no control. So stress release is often an attempt to regain a little bit of control, however you do it. But there are negative and positive ways to deal with your stress. So let's talk about what negative stress relievers look like and we call these unhealthy stress relievers. Sometimes people uh, look to uh, anger or rage toward themselves or other people as a way to relieve their stress and let off steam. Bottling it up is another way to deal with it. Substance use is all too easy, especially for young people, for our children and teens um, and young adults to turn to substance use. Self-injury is a form of uh, stress relief. Uh, Self-injury actually releases endorphins and produces this, this uh, feel-good feeling. So um, some people use that as a stress reliever. Bullying and cyberbullying do that same thing. As we said, this is about getting control. And when you are controlling other people, which is you know, the basic, the balance of power that bullying uh, sets up, then that relieves that pressure. That feels good for a minute. And then some people use food as a stress reliever. These measures may provide relief, but it's more short-lived. It's just a quick fix. It doesn't really provide lasting relief. The other problem with these stress relievers are that the brain tends to memorize these behaviors so that they become automatic go-tos when the stress is high. The brain can, come be addic can become addicted to anger, to substance use, to self-injury, to bullying, to food, to all these stress relievers um, that when it reach reaches that stressed out point, it automatically wants to go to those things. So the problem is that a behavior that starts as an attempt to feel more in control can end up controlling the person. So let's talk about positive or healthy stress relievers. Keep in mind that these stress relief tips are applicable to us as adults and good for us to teach to our children, whatever age they are, from toddlers to teens to young adults. Um, the things we're talking about today apply to all of us. 
First of all, it's really important to push the pause button when our stress levels get too high. And we need to teach our children that it's okay for them to do that when the stress is just too much. There's no point to pushing through stress. It just builds up and builds up and magnifies. We have to learn to push that pause button, even if it's only for a couple of minutes, just to get off that roaring freight train for a second. But here's some other things that we can do when we do that. Connect and disconnect. You know, it's hard during COVID to nurture relationships when people aren't seeing each other face to face, but we need people more than ever. We have to find new ways to connect with friends and family from a distance using things like Facebook and Zoom. Also, it's equally important to disconnect. Find time for yourself to unplug from the news and the noise and recharge. Get good rest. Research shows that getting good quality sleep can affect your mood and positive thinking. Keep moving. Exercise is really important because it helps clear our system of harmful stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, and it promotes feel-good chemicals like serotonin and endorphins. Even mild exercise is really beneficial for your brain health. And finally, speak up. If you're overwhelmed and anxious, talk to someone about how you're feeling. Even if your problems or stressors haven't changed, sharing your emotions with someone can bring relief and remind you that you're not alone. Just as important for us as adults is to model positive stress relief. You've all heard that phrase, more is caught than taught, and our children will handle stress in the ways that we handle stress. So if we are resorting to negative stress relievers, they see us stressed out, they see us head for alcohol or uh, to take it out on other people, whatever, then that is what they're going to get, not what you tell them, they're going to, to model that behavior. So it's good to, to uh, let children know you are stressed out, but let them see you handling your stress in positive ways. I encourage you to take a look at this section of our foundation's website, granthalliburton.org. Um, it has a lot of handouts and short videos about managing stress and your own mental health during the pandemic. Uh, this is good. This is some, some of these are specifically for young people. Some are specifically for adults. So check it out. There are a lot of good things uh, that don't take a lot of time to look at. Uh, just click on the pandemic resources tab on the homepage. So the reason we talk about stress is because it's the number one trigger for depression. If we can learn to control our stress, it can keep our brains in a healthier state. If we were talking about heart health today, it'd be great to talk about CPR and what to do if you encounter someone having a heart attack, but it would be better if we backed up and talked about the things that, help, that can help prevent a heart attack, like heart health and diet and exercise. So that's what we're doing here when we talk about mental health. We start at the beginning with stress and how important it is to deal with your stress in positive ways because that can protect you from problems down the road. So now let's talk about depression. What is depression? Depression is a treatable medical condition that involves the body, mood, thoughts, and thoughts, and affects the way a person eats, sleeps, feels about self and thinks about things. So that gives you a picture of how pervasive and all encompassing depression can be. It's not like just one part of your body is uh, affected like, like a sprained ankle or something, but depression really affects your, your whole self. But let's go back to that first line. Depression is a treatable medical condition. You know, for too long, we've thought of mental illness, psychiatry, and what happens in the brain as intangible, vague things that aren't like other diseases of the body. But the brain is an organ of the body, just like the heart, lungs, and stomach. And things can go wrong with the brain. So illnesses that affect the brain are treatable medical conditions. I always say it's time we start treating diseases above the neck the same way we treat diseases below the neck. So let's let that frame our thinking today about depression. So here are the symptoms of depression. This is a long list, but a person doesn't have to have all these symptoms to have depression. But, the, but some of the symptoms could be like a depressed, irritable mood, or just a feeling of nothing, um, losing interest in things they used to enjoy, being really tired, having no energy, feeling restless or anxious, changes in appetite or weight, sleeping more or less than usual, having trouble concentrating, and with children, 
um, and, and teens and young adults at all ages, really, we can see that trouble with concentrating show up certainly in their grades. Um, and sometimes we jump on the grades and, and, um, and harp uh, uh, about the, their grades falling and they need to do a better job of studying. Uh, but we really need to look beneath the surface and say, what's causing that? Are they having any of these symptoms that might be affecting their ability to think and focus and learn and concentrate? Because grades is where they will show up as well as behaviors. Having feelings of guilt or worthlessness, feeling hopeless or helpless. And certainly if they're having recurring cots of uh, thoughts of death or suicide. So as I said, you, a person doesn't have to have all these symptoms to um, say that it's to have depression, but all you need to remember is three, two, one. If you see three or more of these symptoms lasting for two weeks or longer, all at one time, it doesn't necessarily mean you have depression, but it means you need to get a checkup to see. Three or more of these symptoms lasting two weeks or longer, all at one time. Let's take another uh, illness, for example. Say I, I say three I see three symptoms in myself. Um, let's say I have a sore throat, I'm ach achy, and I have a cough. I do have laryngitis, so I apologize for that. But let's say today I have these symptoms. I couldn't say for sure if I have strep throat or bronchitis or what it is. I don't think I could properly diagnose myself based on a few symptoms. I need to get a professional to sort that out for me, right? Well, the same is true for depression. We may see three, four, five of these symptoms in ourselves or someone else, but the key is to get professional help. Get a doctor to see if that's what's going on or if there's an underlying medical condition or something else you need to be aware of. Talking with your primary care physician or pediatrician is a great place to start when you're searching for a diagnosis for what appears to be symptoms of depression. Now I wanna take a second here to just bust some myths about depression that, that unfortunately some people just still believe. Depression is not a sign of weakness. It's not the same as being sad. It's not a condition that can be wished away or fixed by just pulling yourself together. Depression, depression is a treatable medical condition and that's what we want to remember. So what can cause depression? Well, we've already talked about stress as being the number one trigger for depression, and that can come from any kind of setbacks, recent loss. And, and remember that loss is loss of routine. And when, when students are sent home from college or when they can't go back to school, uh, when things change in their environment, they experience loss, loss of relationships, loss of community, um, loss of routine. And we need to remember that they are dealing with loss and in some cases kind of a grief about those losses um, during these times. Um, the stress can also come from family problems and the pressure of high expectations. But also depression can be caused by alcohol and drug use. Alcohol and drugs have that exact direct physiological impact on the brain. They go right to the center, that center of the brain that is the same uh, pleasure center as, um, as, as, as alcohol and drugs go to and they embed themselves there. And so um, alcohol and drug use have that depressive effect on that pleasure center and can cause depression. Also, it can be hereditary and it can be the result of a chemical imbalance in the brain, which we're pretty familiar with. What helps depression? Well, it's a lot of the same things that help with stress. Sleep is really important um, and good quality sleep that's not interrupted by noise, lights, or things that keep from get us from getting that deep REM sleep because that's what the brain needs to regenerate and rejuvenate during the night. This means keeping phones and devices out of the bedroom. I know that's unthinkable, but that's the way we ensure that we get adequate hours of undisturbed sleep. Exercise and eating right are also important. They're critical to helping with depression. We've talked about the benefits of exercise, but eating right is also important. When we eat too much processed food, lots of fats, sugars, too much caffeine, that's not good for our brains. We need to eat lots of healthy foods, plants, vegetables, other foods that are good for brain health. Connecting with others helps depression. You know, when a person has depression, it's easily to want to isolate, easy to want to isolate yourself. So it's important to make that extra effort to connect with people that you can trust and talk to. Getting enough sunlight is another thing that helps depression. It, sunlight releases feel-good chemicals in the brain like serotonin and endorphins. 
Don't forget to unplug and unwind the same way we talked about coping with stress. Also, you should not hesitate to seek therapy and counseling for managing depression and take prescribed medications as needed. All these things help depression, but they're the same things that help us protect our brain health in the first place. Just remember day to day that these are the things your brain really needs in order to be healthy. Why is it important to treat depression? Well, for one thing, depression can lead to other problems. When your brain is depressed, it doesn't feel good. It's not gonna perform well, not in relationships, not in academic performance, not in a job, not in, not in the family, not in, in your whatever. Your brain is not, is not operating on all cylinders. So that can lead to other problems. Now for young people especially, and for adults, it can lead to conflicts with other family members, conflicts with, uh, with peers, conflicts with teachers and, and other superiors. Um, it can lead to a lot of problems. It can lead to falling grades, as we said, and it can lead to a higher risk for suicide. But remember this, depression is a treatable medical condition. So we've talked about stress, as it being a number one trigger for depression. We've talked about depression being a risk factor for suicide. And now we're at that topic that nobody really wants to talk about, especially not in the context of our children. So I think a valid first question is, do we really have a problem with suicide or is it just an isolated tragedy that occurs once in a while? Well, let's look at some numbers. In the United States, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death when you look at all ages together. But, it, but it's the second leading cause of death among ages 10 to 34. So another question might be, why would a person consider suicide? Well, research with thousands of people who have attempted suicide and survived um, has told us these, these, these three things. One is most people who consider suicide don't really want to die. They just want to end the pain. Given another option, they would rather live. I think this is a game changer. When we think about the people who are, are thinking of taking their own lives, don't really want to do that. They just can't see another way out. They just can't find another way to deal with the unrelenting psychological pain. And if they were given another option, they'd rather live. I think this is one of the most hopeful things that we can, can remember from our talk today, and that is suicide is highly preventable. If you know the warning signs and you know how to step in and intervene and have a conversation with a person and connect them with help, suicide is preventable. So it might be really important if we know what those warning signs are. I'm gonna go through 10 warning signs that indicate that a person may be thinking about suicide. And I wanna say two things about these. One is just like the list of depression symptoms, um, a person doesn't have to exhibit everything on this list in order to be uh, going through suicidal behavior or thinking. If there are two or three or four of these things, that's enough for you to take action. That's a, those are enough symptoms for you to take the next step and have a talk with them. The second thing I wanna say about these warning signs is they seem kind of benign, but let me tell you as a mom who has lived through seeing these warning signs and not having known what I was seeing because no one ever told me there was such a thing as warning signs. Um, these are very extreme. My son exhibited every one of these warning signs in the weeks and months before he died. And I can tell you they're, they're not moderate, they're very extreme. So one is mood swings, extreme mood swings. And these would also be things that are not normal for this person, for their personality. Also impulsive or reckless behavior. They, they might engage in things like reckless driving or, or all kinds of things that um, without any thought of how it would endanger themselves or someone else. Aggressive or hostile behavior. This would look like just extreme rages. Um, it's kind of like you've never seen this kind of rage from this person before. Neglecting appearance or hygiene is another one. Um, and that seems kind of odd, but the thing is that when a person feels like they're pulling away from this world, some things just don't matter. Changing clothes, dealing with personal hygiene, they just that just kind of goes by the wayside. So that would be an easy thing to spot. 
Increased use of alcohol or drugs can be a warning sign as a person tries to, to increase their self-medicating to deal with their psychological pain. Also, a person who doesn't use alcohol or drugs might start using during this period of time. Another warning sign is giving things away. Just like an adult, for example, who has a terminal illness, wants to put his affairs in order in advance, knowing that he's going to die. Even young people, even teenagers, even children and teenagers have this instinct to put their affairs in order. And for children and teens, sometimes that means giving things away that are important to them. My son gave away um, almost all of his band equipment before he died. Um, just it was, it was that instinct to put his affairs in order to be giving things away. Withdrawal from friends and family and associates, big time withdrawal, not a little bit, but just totally walling themselves off from the world. Talking about wanting to die, making comments like, well, if so-and-so doesn't happen, I'm just gonna kill myself, or I wish I were dead, or I think my family would just be better off without me. Those kind of comments we hear from people sometimes, and they are, um, they're, they're, they're spoken in kind of an uh, offhanded way, like they don't really mean it. And sometimes, most of the time, people say those kind of things and they don't mean it. But here's the thing, people who say it and do mean it, they say it in that same casual manner as a person who's just throwing it out there for, for dramatic effect. So what we have to do is take those comments seriously anytime we hear them. Uh, if it's a friend even, you pull that friend aside and say, hey, I just want to check in with you. I don't let anybody say uh, that that comment you just made about if you didn't get that promotion, you were going to shoot yourself. I just don't let people make that comment without checking in and say, asking, was there any truth to what you just said? Do we need to talk about this? So take that as a very serious warning sign. Feeling hopeless or having no reason to live. You know, when a person gets to a place where they give up hope of anything ever being better again, that's a very dangerous place to be. And finally, making a plan. If they're Googling ways to kill, my, kill yourself or they're um, deciding when and where and how they would do it or they're stockpiling pills, looking for ways to get their hands on a gun, whatever it is, if they're making a plan, that's also a serious warning sign. In fact, these last three points uh, with the red bullet points are signs of immediate risk of suicide. And if you observe one or more of those in a person, two or three, and certainly if you see all three of them, then you want to take immediate steps um, to, to help them, to respond to them. So what do you do if you've seen some of those warning signs and you're concerned? Well, you need to have a conversation. And to help with that, we've created a little three-part process called TAG, which stands for Take It Seriously, Ask Questions, and Get Help. So let's go through this, how you have a conversation with someone that you're concerned about um, having is being at risk for suicide. First is take it seriously. So the first thing you want to do is find a place for a quiet private conversation and express your concerns. Tell them exactly what you're seeing. I see that you've been isolating yourself lately. You're not spending as much time with friends as usual. I see you sort of having this feeling of hopelessness. Can you tell me more about that? What do you, what's going on? What are you feeling? When they're sharing with you, your job is to listen. Don't interrupt, don't judge, don't act shocked or angry. If you can get them talking to you and pouring out their pain, then you want to listen. Even the most well-meaning interruption like, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. People love you and this is just temporary. Times will get better. When you do that, you're not listening and you have shut down the conversation because if they thought that they could share these intimate feelings with you, now they're backing up and they're saying, well, not so much. Just listen. Save those comments and those help, those helpful, the helpful encouragement that you have until later. At some point, though, do offer them some reassurance. Let them know they're not alone, that depression can be treated and problems can be worked out. Just create a safe pace, sp space for them to talk about how they're, how they're feeling. A stands for ask questions. Remember that talking openly about this subject is the first step to, to getting help. 
It's a long held myth that if you talk about suicide, you may plant the idea in a person's head, especially in this day and age when even our elementary school children are exposed to so much in social media and uh, online and um, on uh, TV and in movies. Um, there's hardly uh, anyone who hasn't been exposed to the idea of suicide and has not thought about it when things get really dark. During this conversation, if you get the indication that they really are struggling with despair and hopelessness, at some point, you're going to need to ask the critical question. Do you sometimes feel so bad that you think about suicide? You might say something like, I can tell that you've been struggling a lot and you're in a lot of pain. And, and I'm, I just, I wonder if sometimes you think about ending your life. This is a hard question to look someone in the eye and ask, especially if it's someone you care about deeply. But if we don't ask this question, we won't know the answer. And you have to know that answer. When someone is considering suicide, it continues to grow larger and larger in their mind. And just talking about it actually relieves some of the burden for that person. So if they say yes, they are suicidal, you wanna ask, have you thought about how you do it or have you decided when, have you made a plan? Because we know if a person has gotten this far in their thinking, they are at the point of immediate crisis. G stands for get help. So get help can mean one of two things, depending on whether the person that you've just talked to is suicidal or is not suicidal. Either way, they need some help. So if this person says they're not thinking of suicide, um, they've shared that they're struggling, so you want to encourage them to get a mental health checkup. Try to persuade them to get an assessment um, through, from either a primary care physician or pediatrician um, that might lead to them getting treatment. Talk to them about how effective treatment can be to help get their problems and their pain worked out. And it was, as with any other kind of treatable medical condition, early intervention is best. If the person says they are thinking about suicide, take action immediately. A person who is suicidal can act on those feelings in a split second, and you can't possibly keep them totally safe on your own for a period of time. The first option is get that person to the emergency room where they can get 24 seven observation and psychiatric treatment. If you can't get them to the emergency room for any reason, maybe you don't have transportation, um, maybe the person's in a psychotic state or brandishing a weapon, then call 911 and let them know you have a mental health crisis. Tell them all the details. Most every major city now has a mental health crisis intervention team on their police force. So if you explain that you have a mental health crisis, they can send out trained officers who know how to de-escalate a situation and safely transport that person to the emergency room and that's what you want. You can also call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline for assistance with what to do next and I'll give you that number in a moment. Two things, very important things to remember. Never leave a person who is suicidal alone until help is available. As I said, they can act on those, those uh, feelings in a split second using anything, a sharp object, a pen, anything that they could puncture or, um, or pills or anything like that that they could hurt themselves with. And the other thing is take away anything they have that could be harmful. Just say, hey, let's work together to keep you safe until we can get you some help. Let me hold on to your bag. Let me have what's in your pockets. I'll just hold on to these for you for a while. If you've gotten this far in a conversation with someone and you've earned their trust to this extent, they're very, um, very likely to cooperate with you and hand those things over so that they're not um, a threat to themselves. This is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number. The good thing about this is when you call this number from your cell, it uses the GPS on your phone to determine your location. And your call is answered directly by the nearest crisis line, wherever you are in the country. That's what you need in a crisis. You need people who can tell you where the nearest emergency room is or tell you about local resources. I urge you to save this in your phone today. Put it under crisis, suicide prevention, whatever. But someday when you've long forgotten about this talk we've had today together, you may need this and you may need it instantly. So please save that in your phone. Also, there's a, there's a national crisis text line now. You can text any word at all to 741741. 
and they'll be on there instantly to chat with you and help over text. This is really good because our generation doesn't, some people don't like to talk so much as they like to text. So share this with the young people in your life. Um, I've tried this out. I've texted this, this line and I wasn't pretending to be suicidal, but I told them I was just checking it out. And I have to tell you, I could not believe how quick, how conversational, how warm and gracious they are. It, it feels just like talking to someone. So please save this in your phone as well. Our, um, our uh, foundation started a mental health navigation line that's available from 10 to 6, Monday through Friday. The number is 972-525-8181. Um, and that is uh, uh, people who can help you, assist you with finding um, the resources you're looking for, finding providers, helping you figure out what you need. Um, a lot of what we do with this is called Here for Texas because we are in Texas, but we've helped people during the pandemic all over the nation. And so feel free to, to utilize that if you like. So that's TAG, take it seriously, ask questions and get help. I hope that makes you feel like you could have a conversation with somebody that you're concerned about and connect them with help. So we've talked about what, con what contributes to suicidal thinking. And I wanna tell you about three things that can increase the chances of a person not resorting to suicide. One is resilience. We all need resilience. The Centers for Disease Control says that now that more than half the time when a person takes their own life, it is simply because they didn't have the coping or problem solving skills to get through a hard time. You know, this is something we can work on, developing resilience, the ability to bounce back, to work our way through problems, to help our children learn to work out their own problems with our guidance and not fixing everything for them. We can work on these skills. So I think this is really positive for all of us, that if that protects a person from becoming suicidal, potentially, um, just working on them feeling confident about their ability to navigate the hard parts of life. The second protect, protective factor is connection. A sense of belonging is really important to protect a person against suicide. They need these four connection, strong connections in these areas. One, family. Very important, especially for young people, that they have at least one family member that they know loves them unconditionally and would do anything for them and stand by them. The second most important connection is school or work. Uh, for a young person, this means that when they walk through the doors of a school or a university, walk on that campus, they feel like they belong there, that they have a place, that they're connected to that institution, and they're valued for more than just their grades. Uh, the third most important connection is peer relationships, and this means helping our, guide our children and prepare them when they grow up to choose carefully in the relationships that they, they uh, make, make friends with. And it doesn't mean a person needs a lot of friends, it means they need at least one friend who gets them, who they can trust and confide in, and will, um, will, will have their back in times of trouble. And fourth is community, feeling like you belong in the community, either through work, volunteering, or, or belonging to uh, an organization. For our students, this can mean belonging to just being in a school, being in a class, being on a team, um, working on a project, um, even after school jobs, things like that, this sense of belonging in the wider world. You see how this starts with the closest thing, family, and then it goes outward in circles like the family and then the school and work life and then peers and friendships and finally the bigger world at large, the community. These are things that we need to be very um, specific about, conscientious about building and nurturing in our children because these are the things that tether a person to the planet. So it's important that we work on those. The third protective factor is safe firearm storage. And I'll tell you why. Two out of every three firearm deaths in this country are suicides. That means every time that there of all the deaths that occur as a result of a firearm, two out of three times it's a suicide. Only one third of the time is it a homicide or, a, or an accidental shooting. 85% of young people who die by firearm suicide used a family member's gun. Well, that makes sense because a lot of our guns in our country are, are left loaded and unlocked in the nightstand drawer. Easy, easy access. 
Uh, firearms are the leading method of suicide more than all other methods combined. Again, going back to how easy it is. When a person is feeling at that, that lowest point and capable of going through the, the action of taking their own life, ending their own life, they will go for the easiest, quickest thing they can find. If they have to go out to acquire something, rope, pills, something like that, if there's time and distance between that strong desire to die and the moment when they can act on the plan, sometimes those feelings will fade. But if there's something easily accessible like a firearm, then it is instant in the moment, it's lethal, and it hardly ever gives a person a second chance. So all I am saying is this, please lock up your firearms it could save a life. So the facts are that we've talked about, stress is the number one trigger for depression, depression is a risk factor for suicide, and suicide is the second leading cause of death among youth ages 10 to 34. But that's not what I want you to remember from today. I want you to remember that stress is manageable, depression is treatable, and suicide is preventable. Now we've talked about some hard topics today and, um, and things that require conversations that are sometimes intense and sometimes personal. And those can be very difficult. And maybe you thought about this as we talked about some of these things, they can be really difficult if you don't have a rapport with the child or, the, or, or your young adult or, the, or a coworker or anybody in your life. It can be very difficult to broach the, the subject of how they're feeling. Um, and, and talking about these things. So it's really important to um, establish good open lines of communication with our children early or at any point. It's never too late to start working on this. So we say connection begins with conversation. And one of the handouts that I think we provided to you today is, is this handout here, Start the Conversation, How to Talk to Teens About Mental Health. This works for anybody, really. This would work for a peer if you don't have that kind of relationship and you want to build kind of a deeper relationship. And it's actually very simple. You pick your time. I'm going to give you an example as if this were your teenager, because that's a tough nut to crack. If, you, if your conversation with them mostly uh, starts with when they walk in the door, how much homework do you have? What grade did you make on that test? Is your soccer uniform clean? Did you walk the dog? Blah, blah, blah. That's not conversation. That's checklist parenting. So if that's where you're starting from, this is going to help you get to um, a better level of communication with your kids. I would say uh, pick your time, first of all. Um, I used to wait until after dark to walk the dog, and then I would say to my son, Grant, Grant, I forgot to walk the dog again. Will you go with me? It's dark outside. And so he would always go with me, and we'd walk and we'd talk side by side in the darkness. That's the way uh, uh, males sometimes feel more comfortable with that, or in the car side by side. And just pull one of these questions out of your, out of your hat. Don't tape this to the back to the to your dashboard of your car. That's not cool. Just just think of one of these questions. One of them is, for example, what would you do if somebody gave you a thousand dollars? And so your your child, your teen, your 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 who friend, you know, starts telling you what they would do with a thousand dollars. And that is really not a conversation though until you say, I bet you don't know what I would do with a thousand dollars. And if it's your teen, they'll say, oh, mom, you would be in and out of the shoe store in 10 minutes and that $1,000 would be gone. And you could say, well, no, no, this is what I would do. Well, now you've got a conversation over just the most casual thing. And this seems sort of simplistic, but this works. If your children get used to conversing with you, not in the parent looking down on child kind of structure, but as person to person, and that's going to open the doors later when you have to say to them, I want to check in on you. I want to, I want to know how you're feeling. Will you talk to me about what's going on? They are far more likely to look you in the eye and say, yes, I do. So I urge you to, to take this, look at this, um, and, and you know, I hope it'll be helpful to you. Um, so I think we have time now for some questions. And so if we want to open this up to open the floor to questions, we can do that right now. Feel free to add your questions to the chat if you don't want to say them out loud or if for some reason the technology is not allowing for it. One thing I'd like to say is that thinking about this idea of talking with our kids again, 
sometimes it's it's really hard to to talk to them and um, so and sometimes we say the wrong thing or we're afraid of saying the wrong thing so on that to, um, I want to go back to this for a second on the back of this handout there are things to say and things not to say, things that hurt and things that help. So for example, if they're talking to you about how bad they feel about themselves and we say, hey, we all go through times like that, this, that's dismissive and it will show you something else that you would say instead. Like, I know that I can't begin to, to imagine how you really feel, but I want you to know that I'm here for you and, and I could go through this, we can go through this together. Another bad thing to say is, well, here's my advice. A better thing to say is, I'm here, I'm listening. So take a look at those and see if those might be helpful to you as well. One question that I would be happy to clear up for everyone is that I will try to send out these handouts to all attendees along with a recording of today's presentation. Very good. And there's a wealth of other resources on our website, especially if you look at that pandemic resources uh, page as well. Any other questions? And if not, uh, Vinita, thank you so much. This was really helpful, uh, particularly as we are uh, working with students all over the uh, age range. And I think this is just really helpful thing to keep in our minds as we work through um, what, what some issues that they might be facing could be. Thank you. I do want to share one last thing. Um, and that is that we have a conference every year called When Life Hands You Teenagers. It's, uh, it's got, we have a wide range of speakers from across the country this year because it's virtual, which means any one of you could attend this conference. It's three days, September 22nd, 3rd, and 24th, so coming right up from 10 to 1 uh, each of those three days. It's just going to be full of wonderful speakers, and uh, if you're unable to attend during those hours, there's an option when you register to have, get access to uh, replay these at any time at your convenience through the end of this year. So this is a wonderful, rich resource, and we're so happy to be able to share these wonderful speakers and topics with, with anyone. So um, go to granthalliburton.org slash WLHYT, and you'll find all the details there. Thank you again for your time. I really enjoyed being with you, and if you have any questions, you can certainly reach out to me at the foundation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vinita, and thank you everyone else for joining. Hope you have a great week. Take care.